So welcome everybody to the ongoing class on meditation. For those who are coming to the introduction to meditation class, that is being held in the room to my right, between here and the uh, reception room. That's being held by Dennis. Uh-oh. Can you hear me over there? Okay, but please know all those people in the uh, beginner's meditation class, Dennis is an excellent teacher. He's been a good friend for so many years, so I give full recommendation to his great uh, wit and his great wisdom. And if you really want to find out when it's question time, please ask him about uh, the dog who had a CAT scan. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's be serious now. But you know, one of the reasons why I don't mind telling funny stories you know, before the meditation. One reason is because it creates a nice state of mind you know, before you start to cross your legs and get into meditation. Are you okay in there? Are we all ready to go? Good. Uh, sometimes the presence of joy, inspiration, uh, happy mood. If you can begin the meditation with a happy mood, Sometimes it's looking forward to this opportunity to sit down, be quiet, peaceful, and get some uh, stillness inside. It's as if that's one of the reasons why the mind does think too much and is restless is because it's not happy where it is. It doesn't have that contentment in this. You may find some meditation groups do some chanting before they start meditating or they uh, do some reflections, anything to uplift the mind, to make it feel like enjoyable. You know, I, I noticed when I was a young monk, I just had lots of energy, because that's what it's like being young. You've got, you got know, full of beans and looking forward to exploring what happens in meditation. And all of that was just very, made meditation actually quite easy. You could get lost in restlessness, but nevertheless, you were alive and you were uh, interested in exploring what happens when the mind becomes still, when things disappear. What it's actually like to be able to sit and then after a while when all the body vanishes and you can't feel any aches or pains or heat or anything. And those sorts of experiences were interesting. You're actually exploring you know, part of the world which for many people they don't have access to. You know, the world of the mind, some of the interesting things you can experience there. And so when you actually get into those meditations when you're young, you want to explore the world. But, you know, I do notice because I'm not a young whippersnapper anymore. I'm an old whippersnapper, or whatever you call it. But nevertheless, sometimes to be able to create that joy, that energy, that is important because that just gets the meditation to be peaceful really easily. I've often noticed that when you're inspired, when you hear something, see something which really you know, inspires you, gives you lots of joy and lots of uh, confidence, that then that makes the mind so easy to meditate. I know so many times just in my life as a meditating monk, you find a nice place which is so peaceful, or hear a nice talk which is just so clear. Then you have the sense of the mind is being prepared. To, you know, it doesn't have any business, it doesn't have to figure things out, it doesn't have to do anything. It's like you're put in this beautiful position, just sit down, relax and enjoy. I think you may all know by now, those of you who've been listening to me long enough, that it's when you do things, that is what uh, prevents the meditation from really taking off. And if it's so hard not to do anything. That's one of the problems. Sometimes people, they say, well, I'm going to let go. How do you let go? You don't do letting go. If you try to do letting go, it's the last thing which is close to letting go. You just let go of doing. You just be here. Stay here, like park the car. Get out of the car. Stop walking. Sit down on the grass. Just enjoy this moment. And don't do anything in the whole world. Problem is, people say, well, you know, it's just too hot. You're going to get baked. 
It's too dangerous, you're going to get hurt. It's just, uh, I've got to do something. And it's a sign of our world that we're just not used to not doing anything. Even in the evenings you go to your home at night and you're always looking at things to do. You know, either just check the emails, check the messages, go and see some movie or something, clean up, do something. In our world these days there's so much to do. But then sometimes as a monk you say, is there that much to do? Do you really have to do all of that? And after a while, now you find that you actually you make work for yourself. In other words, you don't really have to do it. Just leave it alone. And when you leave it alone, it's amazing how much peace you can find. What you're doing, you know, this is the deep down, you're actually disengaging from the world. Giving less importance to the world of stuff, to the world of even communicating with one another, to the world of you know, finance, the world of solving problems outside. You're letting go of all of that, renouncing it, getting some distance from it. It's one of the reasons why people, they do go on holidays, to get away from it all. I remember just in our monastery over in Serpentine, I had a hut years ago, which had a beautiful view over the Southwest Highway. It's a long distance away. But I remember sitting there on a Friday afternoon, evening, and I could look through the window and see all the headlights of the cars going south on a Friday evening. And on a Sunday afternoon, see all the headlights of the cars going north back into Perth again. It was always uh, strange that they'd go one way to get away from it all, and they'd meet all their friends down south and they'd all come back to Perth. They weren't getting away from it all. And those monks would come here on a Friday, when everyone went south. And on a Sunday afternoon, we went south, back to monastery, and, every <laughs> and everybody went north. Sometimes it was quite nice going the opposite way than most other people. And that's how you get away from it all. In other words, but why, do you, why are you going anywhere? Sometimes I love those similes of people over here. Some people have these beautiful houses with gardens. Why do you want to go anywhere? Spend a lot of money in your own home, making it comfortable, making it peaceful. And the first thing we do when we have days off or holidays, we go somewhere else. I can't figure that out sometimes. If you were, uh, had a nice house, and you had two weeks or three weeks holiday, why didn't you stay in your own house and enjoy it? Don't they ever say there's no place like home? But a lot of times people don't know how to enjoy their own house. They always think, I've got two or three weeks, I can improve something. I can clean something. And sometimes that all your rest goes. I always think that a house, a home, it's a place where you can rest. You go out there to work in the world and you know, contribute to the improvement in this world. But when you go home, that's a place to rest. It's one of the reasons why you know, I get asked to do so much work for others. But as you all know, I've got my little hidey hole, my cave. And I go into that cave, I'll go in there on Sunday evening when I get back from here and just go and hide in there two doors so I can't hear anything outside, lock them both. And then I can sit inside there, I can't hear any sound from the outside. It's, I know the temperature inside my cave right now, same as on Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, it was exactly 23 degrees, it's underground. No air con, it's just what's what happens when you have a cave underground. It keeps this constant temperature. I've got nothing to do in that cave. Because so I've got nothing to do. That's how you do nothing. It's this little bubble where I can just, nothing to do in the whole world. I can sit there, cross my legs, get myself comfortable, and just stop. Stop all 
thoughts, there's nothing to think about. I've been on this earth 72 years now and thought many things. How many of those thoughts are undone? You thought enough thoughts already, now you need to be still and be peaceful. And when you value stillness and peace above solving problems, then you can find out how the mind can become very peaceful and content. So it's like an attitude which you start the meditation with. You're not sitting down, closing your eyes to find answers to problems. Just allowing answers and problems to both disappear, to vanish. And in that stillness, that's where you find incredible wisdom, joy, energy, power, all the things which thoughts and philosophies were supposed to deliver to you, you find when you're very, very still. That's when you can see the furthest, when the mind is not searching for things, when it's just looking, aware and kind. So that's just a little bit of an introduction to the meditation today. And so now we can actually start the meditation. I will mention again that those who have come here for the introduction to meditation class, that is being held in the room to my right over here, being led by good old Dennis, Dennis Shepherd. And we're going to be doing the ongoing class here. The main difference is we sit for longer periods. And I try to introduce more deeper aspects of the meditation. So, everybody comfortable, okay? Great, so let's begin. So if you'd like to just to close your eyes, and if you're not already in your meditation posture, please just adjust and get yourself comfortable. I'm going to rehydrate. Because I closed my eyes last of all. I'm going to ask each one of you, with your eyes closed, please put a smile on your face. You'll find it makes it easier to meditate. Because when you're smiling, it's much easier to engage with the moment, with now. If there's any sort of negativity, you find you want to escape from that negativity by feeling that longing with fantasies or plans or memories. And many people have a whole filing cabinet, like a store, of stuff they can think about if they really need to. But here in the meditation, we try and avoid all stuff of the past and the future. It's a wonderful thing to do, just to take the happiness, the peace, any amount of silence, which you can bring in from the past, keep that. And let all the busyness, all the jobs, all the unfinished business, what's done is finished. So you can have some freedom, a freedom which you very, very, very much deserve. Usually I start by relaxing the body. I'm going the other way this time, relaxing the mind first of all. Get this beautiful mind state of joy and happiness like you are on a holiday. Now you've gone on this journey, not the journey overseas, but the journey inside. You don't need a passport, you don't need visas. You don't need baggage. In fact, no baggage is allowed at all. So you're walking into this beautiful resort 
inside, not needing anything, everything is supplied for you. And you can let go of all of those, again, the unfinished business, the problems which you try to tie up and finish with, but you could never do it. You don't need to. You just let it go and go inside. Even the Buddha would actually call this going inside, going into the cave of the heart. Hadaya Guha. I kind of like that metaphor of the Buddha. Because when you go inside, even just inside your body and mind right now, it's like you know, even outside the doors of this hall don't just exist. It's beyond your body and the rest of the hall doesn't exist for you. If you close your eyes and your perceptions remain inside your body and your mind. It simplifies things. And inside this body, you know, that I cannot let go of that easily. If there's an ache or a pain, it can disturb you. So still I have to just be aware of my own body. And now I'm not doing the sweeping meditation today, I just do something a little bit different. I just feel my whole body sitting here. All connected together. Because I know if one part is uncomfortable, it will affect the rest of my body. And in this moment, what I feel is uncomfortable is my waist. So I just adjust that. What's uncomfortable in your body? Please don't just sit there and endure. Adjust and enjoy. Be kind to your own body. And I kind of, I can hear the sound of the wind outside that I do let in. Because it reminds me of many times sitting in mountains in different countries and hearing the wind, hearing the wind just brush the, the leaves of the trees. And that wind just brought back a wave of nostalgia of the beautiful moments of the past. Of solitude, of peace, of not having to prove anything to anybody. Just to be content and still. And I still check my body. I know my shoulders sometimes get too tight, so I relax them now. And check my fingers, they were in a bad position. And I know that if any time in the meditation I'm disturbed by an uncomfortable part of my body, I don't hesitate just to look at it, relax it, and even move it, adjust it. I know any disturbance by adjusting my body slightly is much more benefit from the greater sense of ease afterwards. I always know that takes me into a deeper meditation by the end. I care for my body. And as usual, you know, I didn't do any scanning of my body. I can feel my body, the whole of it right now, relaxed, at ease. And that becomes kind of the purpose 
at the beginning of the meditation to see how relaxed my body can be. And I know I cannot will my body to be relaxed. Any will, any decision or choice just disturbs everything. I let my body relax. I allow it. It does it by itself. My job is just to stop interfering. And I always enjoy the feeling of peace. Knowing that the best way to get this relaxation feeling is to let the body do it by itself, get out of the way. And I know that's exactly the same thing, the same method to get the mind to be at peace. Be aware and be kind. And if you find it, what should I be doing? Don't be doing anything. Just be in this moment. No past, no future. And just see if you can explore how peaceful you are. Peace. First of all, feel it. What is peace like as an emotion, as a state of mind? How does peace arise? It can never arise in the future or the past. It's only right here. And it comes when you start to appreciate and value just being here. And you're kind to this moment. You deserve to be peaceful. Once you can feel what it's like and enjoy that feeling of freedom Once you can really enjoy it, then the peace becomes stable. It's not what you will or decide. It's just a perception of joy, delight, which satisfies you. And once you have that satisfaction, which leads to contentment, then the peace only grows stronger and stronger. And you also are very careful to make sure that you don't get caught up in just small thoughts because small thoughts get the brain going into bigger thoughts and fantasies and philosophies. Your job is just to be silent, to get beyond language. What is language trying to describe? You go to what it's trying to describe and stay there rather than the words and the concepts. It's much more fun, much more productive. And when the mind is silent, content, 
in this moment, the peace only grows. And if breath is your meditation object, just the breath is just there. You can feel it. You don't do anything. You observe and let the meditation take you. Just like an autopilot. The mind will incline, lean towards more peace, more freedom, more joy. I will be quiet now, I have to. I will start talking again when the meditation is about to end.
just getting close to the end of the meditation now. How peaceful are you? How delightful does it feel inside? It's like I have been on a holiday. Peace, rest. And the sense of what I give importance to changes. Peace and stillness is more important. And I also am aware of how my body feels. Relaxed and strong. I am now going to ring the gong three times. When that gong finishes sounding for the third time, please come out of the meditation. So we're just going to get the questions. Hey. So do the questions from overseas first. From Singapore and from Colorado. And just another question from Anonymous. So the first question is about this phenomena, part of meditation called nimittas. If any of you study uh, the Buddha's description of meditation in Anapanasati, you'll find the ninth and tenth, eleventh stages of meditation. He starts to say that you can experience the nimitta, the citta, he calls it. This is how the mind experiences itself and how you uh, brighten up that nimitta and how you stabilize that nimitta, samadha hang jitang. It's all beautiful states of mind. But the question from Singapore, does the form of the nimitta mean anything? Recently I saw one that resembled the northern lights, but it turned into flashing white lights, like firecrackers going off into a dark night. I could even hear the firecrackers. I came out of it sweating and heart pounding. Uh, first of all, that if, you know, that was very joyful, very beautiful, that can count as a nimitta, but it is a complicated nimitta. And the most beautiful nimittas are the ones which are so simple. And in order to turn complicated nimittas into the simple nimittas, all you do is just a complicated nimitta, which many things happening, just choose one thing 
one thing which you can understand can be stable and can be beautiful. I think it was last week which I mentioned that sometimes when you have these beautiful images in the mind, they're not all even, some parts are more beautiful than others. And that's where you learn, just to allow the mind to be drawn into the most beautiful part of the meditation experience. And as you can experience the more beautiful parts of it, it's like you zoom in. You zoom in onto the beautiful part and you zoom into the most beautiful part of the most beautiful part. And that means that things get very beautiful and they also get very stable. So, like resemble the northern lights, brilliant. Find out one part of that image which is the most beautiful. And when you zoom in, it becomes much more stable. When it's flashing white lights, that means not enough stillness there. So, they're okay. Here the firecrackers. I don't know. If you were over in Australia last week, that would be in Australia day, where they do have firecrackers. But sometimes, if you say you hear them, sometimes I would, if that happened to me, I would ask, am I really hearing them? Or is this just the power of association? You see what looks like firecrackers, and you actually almost create that sound which is associated with them. Real, but it's just a way of the perception as to stuff. It came out of it sweating and heart pounding. That's always a sign that you're trying too hard. Sweating and heart pounding. In other words, usually, that when I come out of many meditation in with a nimitta, you're not heart pounding. Your heart is just nice and peaceful. And not sweating, you're really, really cool. It's like intense relaxation. It's one of the reasons why I suggested at the end of each meditation, when you look, how peaceful are you? And just how relaxed is your body? And so after meditation, I'm pretty sure my heart is just so softly beating, just like purring, like a car was half, like a cat was just half asleep but per perfectly aware, but the body is just humming along quietly in the background. Never heart pounding. So, keep on going with this meditation. And limiters, when they're really are limiters, they're gorgeous. And you can relax into them and get so peaceful and so still. And you come out, your heart is hardly moving at all. And not sweating, but nice and cool. Anyway, next one from Colorado. I feel I am getting better at not reacting based on my emotions, but I'm still not great at it and I get frustrated. Any advice for someone struggling with this? Well, please change your idea of perfection. Lower your expectations. Don't try and be perfect. Be content instead then after a while you just cannot get frustrated. When you don't want anything, you don't want to achieve anything, you're just perfectly happy where you are, the frustration just can't come up. And if other people disappoint you, you can lower your expectations of other people. Human beings are human beings. They've got their limitations. They may want to do beautiful, kind, compassionate things, but sometimes it doesn't, their thoughts or ideas, their emotions don't translate into actions which convey those beautiful uh, emotions. So it's nice not to judge anybody. We don't judge anybody. How can you judge anybody? I gave this in the talk to the monks the other day. How on earth can you judge anybody? And get upset at them or praise them? I don't know what they're doing, why they're doing it. Everyone is just learning, growing, doing their best. That's why when I was a school teacher, it's so hard to judge the kids in the class. They're learning, they're growing, they're just kids. They haven't graduated yet, they're going to learn all the lessons of life. But I kind of expect the kids to come into life perfectly disciplined, perfectly polite. Just like the monks in the monastery. You can't expect them to come into the monastery 
perfectly disciplined and perfectly polite. <laughs> and they're all learning. So they do get frustrated at times, but you just let go of that frustration. You don't take it so seriously. Because then you don't want anything. Imagine when all your goals just are abandoned. The frustration doesn't come up anymore. When you look at human beings in all their different stages of development, you don't expect everybody to be perfect, even 1% to be perfect. And then you can never get uh, frustrated. It's not reacting based on your emotions. It's where do those emotions come from? Emotions come from judging and wisdom, which is not really accurate. When the wisdom is accurate, you kind of get sort of frustrated. It's how I remember my teacher, Ajahn Chah, reacting to my own stupidity and the stupidity of other monks. He would just burst out laughing. Any ordinary being would just get frustrated. I teach you all these things, I teach you this, I teach you that, and now this is what you do. But he thought it was so funny, just the way that people reacted. I remember this uh, one man who came, he was the head of the English Sangha Trust. And he came to you know, see Ajahn Chah, and he brought his daughter, who was an 18-year-old, for an 18-year-old birthday. And this daughter, you know, an English young lady, was a real pain in the butt. <laughs> but nevertheless, <laughs> would actually come and ask Ajahn Chah all these you know, crazy questions. And Ajahn said, oh no, please let her. It's entertaining, didn't usually get answered those, asked those questions by an ordinary person. We were way too respectful. But there's you know, a young woman growing up asking these silly questions. He enjoyed it, and actually many of the monks listening also enjoyed it as well. <laughs> it's funny. And that's a beautiful way of looking at sort of people. Instead of getting frustrated, we actually have joy. Find it funny. And how does, oh, this is an easy question. How does kindness improve meditation? And why should it be better than bare mindfulness? Because bare mindfulness, you find, doesn't really catch on to the object. It's like, what's a kind of a good example? Why have you got, like, putting wallpaper on sort of uh, a wall? or putting tiles you know, on the floor in the toilet. You do need something to stick it, the tile, onto the concrete. And this is actually what allows mindfulness to stick to the mind and to grow and become strong. The kindness is just allowing things to be and all of the other emotions which can sometimes destroy the mindfulness and push you away, just disappear. The kindness, the caring, is the important part of uh, the practice. And when mindfulness and kindness do go together, it's like it's easy to watch the breathing, say. Sometimes the breath is there, but it's not delightful. How can you watch something which is just boring? After a while you turn away. You know why it is that sometimes people, they do their meditation, either fall asleep, or they just um, get bored and their mind starts wandering off. Why? If you're kind to something, you can engage with it and it delights you. Even if you have a little cat or a dog or a little bird which you find, you know, and it's just broken a wing or something and you care for it. The interaction between you and that object is totally different. And when you're caring for it, now you find you do have like a connection. It's easy to stay with that object. And that's one of the reasons why when you add the caring to the meditation, I care for my breath, I care for peace. It's important to me. It's beautiful. When I care for it and add the mind, the mindfulness stays. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't just stay. It also increases in its power. And that's one of the parts of mindfulness. Bear mindfulness. Goodness gracious, you do need some joy in it, otherwise it just will not work. Even in the mindfulness trainings, you always have 
you know, that piti sukha comes up, the joy, the happiness, it engages. And I've often mentioned this to you, the deeper the meditation, the deeper the joy, the deeper the happiness. It's not bare. Even that idea of bare awareness, I you know that's never mentioned by the Buddha in the suttas. I don't know if that's anywhere over there. Mindfulness is always accompanied by the the joy, the depth, stillness. It's never bare. Anyway, so that's my answers to the questions over here. Actually, there is sometimes bare awareness, because I sometimes practice that over in Jhana Grove. Any of you have been to Jhana Grove, see we have many teddy bears. <laughs> And honestly, the people thought it was so stupid. Why have you got teddy bears in a meditation center? Or the same thing, that's a teddy rabbit. Can you hold it up so you can see it? Teddy rabbit, what do you do that for? Hey, aren't you old enough to have... Of course not. You put one of those things, a teddy bear, in your lap. And you made... Oh, go on over there as well. Teddy what? Teddy monkey. Okay, two of them. Okay, crikey. <laughs> okay. What does it do? It brings this joy into your mind. And if you put... The first time we did this was over in Hong Kong. One of the meditators over there brought two teddy bears to the meditation retreat I gave, one of the first ones I gave in Hong Kong. And then I said, brilliant. Now, can we please you know, borrow them and we put them on our laps and meditated with the teddy bears. And people found their meditation improved enormously. Because they had that joy, that softness, that care, not this intellectual having to achieve things. And that just softened them. And that was what was missing in their meditation. And it's the same over in Jhana Grove. You know, that I think we've got one or two teddy bears to begin with over there. And they obviously haven't keeping the eight precepts because they have been multiplying. <laughs> and there's so many of them there now. And I encourage people, try it out, experiment, put it on your, your lap. And then that kindness, which is generated from a, a little teddy bear, is enormous. And that just allows the mindfulness to really increase and become powerful. So kindness improves meditation enormously. And if you want to know why, again, it's part of the Eightfold Path. Second factor of the Eightfold Path. The second part of that second fa factor, Samasankapa, it's uh, Awayapada, which is not just means non-ill will, it just means its opposite, which is loving kindness. That's in the second factor of the Eightfold Path. That's one of the reasons why for years, you no know, reading and studying, where is the kindness in the Eightfold Path? It was there in number two, second factor, kindness. Okay, anyway, how about any questions from my audience here? Oh, I do, okay. Well, any questions quick, otherwise Eddie will jump in. <laughs> no, come on, Eddie. Ajahn Brahm, you know the meditation we do here is Samatha meditation? No. Eh? no. It's not Samatha meditation. Oh, it's it all is. of them together. You know, but I say Samatha, because you're talking about, towards the end you say peace, you know. How do you feel peaceful? You that's know? wisdom, that's yeah. insight. Yeah, that's a, yeah, yeah. So what, when you say this, okay, what I'm trying to say is, okay, when we are, and you, you're saying like a, how to say, no, no, don't think, you know. Yeah. So yes. What I'm trying to say is, during this meditation, when we are peaceful, you know, can we radiate, you know, this peaceful energy? Of course energy, you can. Okay, to the parts of our body, you know, when there's a little problem, we're not trying to heal it, okay? We radiate like um, kindness, love, uh, impermanence too, and all these things. Indirectly, when we are not healing, but we are trying to 
put in some little energy to, to, to help it, you know. That's can we do that? Of course you can. That's why sometimes I'm really kind to you. What does that do? That relaxes you, makes you much healthier, feels more at peace. If you're not kind to somebody, how do you feel? You tense up, you become protective. And that's not healthy for the body, everything gets tight. So that's one of the reasons why you can f see that kindness to parts of your own body. It relaxes those parts of the body. And my goodness, I've been experimenting with that all my life as a mug. And sometimes you just got to say you hit your knee or something. You don't try and get rid of that feeling, pain or whatever it's called. You say you're just kind to it. There you are, never mind, sorry. Just, and that what? kindness works. Just one, just, just, just came yeah. my mind. In this peace here, you know, while we met, in yeah. this hour, when we feel that peace, you know, can we radiate this good energy to someone in difficulty, someone, you know? Of course you can radiate that, but it's much better to take that peace as deep as you can go first. It's like if you're going to, say, give a donation to the BSWA, mm. then it's much better to go to work and have enough money to actually to give there, instead of just giving a cent here and a cent there. So when you're actually going to helping somebody else with this beautiful peace and kindness, make sure that the end of the meditation is when you do that, not the middle. Mm. So you've got lots and lots of peace, lots of energy, lots of power, and then zap them. Yeah, that's what I mean. When we have, <laughs> if you don't have enough peace, no. Yeah. So we're really peaceful, you know. That's really, right. Then, you know, then we really get that. And then come out of it, peace, peaceful. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Ajahn. You find sometimes you have enormous power, you feel that. You zap, zap, zap. <laughs> sometimes you. people can feel that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Question? Going? Going. The last question which people always have. Can we go now? <laughs> and the answer is yes. Okay, let's pay respects to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha first.